Honourable Member for Brentford Brent. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I welcome this opportunity to speak today on Bill C-5, a seriously flawed and dangerous piece of proposed legislation. My commentary and opinion on this are shaped by my experience as a lawyer for almost 30 years, with the last 18 years as a Crown Attorney for the province of Ontario. A week ago today, members in this House stood in solidarity to honour and remember the victims of the Montreal Massacre. 14 women were murdered, as well as 10 women and 4 men injured. That day was an opportunity for this House, and especially the Prime Minister and his government, to stand strong against all forms of gun violence and to inform Canadians in very clear terms that they would take immediate steps to curb the ever-increasing tide of this criminal behaviour. And what is most disturbing, Madam Speaker, is that less than 24 hours removed from this commemoration, the Justice Minister tabled Bill C-5, a tone-deaf and ill-timed response from this government. The Prime Minister in the last election promised peace, order and good government. He said that Canada needs leadership that won't back down in the face of rising extremism and that he will take action to put an end to gun violence in our communities. Bill C-5 is the complete opposite to this pledge and proves to be another example of virtue signaling to all Canadians. Bill C-5 was identical to Bill C-22, first introduced in the last Parliament. The bill never made it past the second reading before the unnecessary federal election was called. The bill would eliminate mandatory minimum penalties for 14 of the 67 offences in the Code, 13 for firearm offences and one for tobacco offence. Notwithstanding what we have heard in the last week by the Justice Minister and his government, this dangerous bill is not targeted to less serious gun crime. As an example, let's take a look at Section 244.2 sub B of the Code. Every person commits an offence who discharges a firearm at a person with intent to wound, maim or disfigure, to endanger the life of or to prevent the arrest or detention of any person. I, I would pledge to any member of this House to somehow convince me that that, is a, that, that would constitute a less serious gun offence. The bill would also eliminate all six mandatory minimums for offences under the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act. These include the very serious offences of trafficking, importing and exporting, and production of controlled substances. Let's think about that for a moment. Those who traffic and produce fentanyl, the most deadly and lethal form of street drug, the same street drug that is sold to millions of addicts, the same drug that is causing an opiate crisis which results in daily overdoses and deaths, that this soft on crime, ideologically driven Liberal government believes these offenders should not expect to receive a minimum period of incarceration. This is utterly shameful and dangerous. As a rookie member and political aficionado, I have repeatedly heard a false narrative from this Prime Minister and his government that former PM Harper is to blame for everything that has gone wrong in this country. Perhaps it's about time for this government to engage in some self-reflection. Contrary to the Justice Minister's talking points that they are turning the page on a failed Conservative criminal justice policy, the fact remains they are keeping intact the other 53 mandatory minimums in the Code and keeping most of the ones introduced by the Conservative Party. The Justice Minister needs to be reminded that it was former PM Pierre Elliott Trudeau in 1977 and Prime Minister Jean Chrétien in 1995 that introduced several mandatory minimums for firearm offences. These penalties have been rooted in our criminal justice system since the early 1890s. Legislators over the decades that followed have relied upon mandatory sentencing tools to mitigate inconsistencies in the exercise of judicial discretion. A key feature of our system of government is that Parliament constantly reviews old legislation and passes new legislation to ensure its laws, including sentencing laws, properly align with the demands of justice. Those demands of justice speak very clearly that there is a tremendous increase in gun violence across this country. Conservatives believe that serious, violent offences that are committed with firearms deserve mandatory prison time. If this government will not take our word on this subject, then perhaps they will listen and reflect on what eloquent jurists have said about gun violence in our communities. Firearm use and possession is not a momentary lapse in judgment. Heavy regulation of firearms and ammunition mean those who possess them had to make concerted efforts to do so. A person does not stumble upon an illegal handgun. 
There is a process of purchasing from a trafficker, secreting the handgun to avoid detection and prosecution. There is a high degree of deliberation and contemplation. Loaded firearms, especially in public, add a dimension of heightened risk. Listen to these chilling words from Justice Malloy in the decision of Farragon. A person with a gun in their hands has a godlike power over life and death. Virtually all that is necessary is to point another person and to apply a few pounds of pressure on the trigger to end a human life. The ease of killing with a gun is an exigent danger to us all. Such immense power with so little reason must be opposed with everything at our disposal. A person who loads a handgun with bullets and then carries that handgun concealed in his person into a public place is by definition a dangerous person. Handguns are used to shoot people. A person who carries a loaded handgun in public has demonstrated his willingness to shoot another human being with it. Otherwise, there would be no need to have it loaded. That person is dangerous. He is dangerous to those with whom he associates. He is dangerous to the police and other law enforcement. He is dangerous to members of his community. He is dangerous to innocent bystanders, including children who may be killed and maimed by stray bullets. According to Public Safety Canada, violent crime involving firearms is a growing threat to public safety in our communities. Gun violence is on the rise, 81% increase in violent offences involving guns since 2009. One in three homicides are firearm related. 47% of Canadians feel gun violence is a threat to their community. Gun violence impacts people in communities across Canada. It happens in urban, suburban and rural communities across every province and territory, in all age and socioeconomic groups, and lastly among those who own guns and those who do not. This is a moment in time to strengthen our gun laws to emphasize the principles of denunciation and deterrence. This is not the time to advance a soft on crime bill which puts communities and victims at risk. Mm -hmm. Mandatory minimum sentences are an important tool for ensuring, not inhibiting, sentence, sorry, justice in sentencing. Rather than eliminating a judge's ability to assess a proportionate sentence, mandatory minimums set a stable sentencing range for an offense, permitting, sentences, sorry, permitting citizens to understand in advance the severity of the consequences that attend to the commission of the offense. The Justice Minister stressed that Bill C-5 is not aimed at hardened criminals, but first-time low-risk offenders. He was quoted by saying, think about your own kids. Perhaps they got into trouble at some point with the law. I bet you would want to give them the benefit of the doubt or a second chance if they messed up. Well, it's a lot harder to get a second chance the way things are now. This is such a disturbing message from the Justice Minister and the Attorney General. I can't think of any other example of being tone deaf to the obvious. We are indeed focusing on serious violent offenders and not misguided, mischievous, youthful first offenders. The Liberal government claims this bill is to, ad to address racism in Canada's criminal justice system. As noted by the Alberta Minister of Justice, K.C. Madhu, quote, While Ottawa's new justice bill contains some reasonable measures, I am deeply concerned about the decision to get tough sentencing provisions for gun crimes, removing tough mandatory penalties for actual gun crimes, undermines the very minority communities that are, all, are so often victimized by brazen gun violence. I also find it disingenuous for Ottawa to exploit a genuine issue like systemic racism to push through their soft on crime bills. As a former Crown Attorney, I am very much aware and wholeheartedly accept, accept that there is a disproportionately higher rate of incarcerated Indigenous and Black Canadians. We as parliamentarians have the tools necessary to put into place measures to address that problem. We already have principles that mandate jurists to consider the background of Indigenous offenders. The Liberal government last year committed $6.6 .6 million to produce better informed sentencing decisions based on an understanding of the adversities and systemic inequalities that black Canadians and members of other racialized groups face. Furthermore, Parliament has an opportunity to put into place a safety valve known as a constitutional exemption that would allow judges to exempt outliers from whom the mandatory minimum would constitute cruel and unusual punishment. This flawed and dangerous bill also substantially alters the conditional sentence regime, which would now allow such a sentence to be imposed for sex assaults, criminal harassment, kidnapping, human trafficking, arson and abduction. 
What I found most ironic is that yesterday we heard from the Justice Minister that this legislation will reduce the significant amount of charter challenges and speed up the disposition of criminal cases. What he failed to address is that the changes to the conditional sentence regime will result in a plethora of increased litigation as the proposed amendments are lawfully unavailable. A condition precedent to the availability of a conditional sentence is that a justice must be satisfied that serving a sentence at home would not endanger the safety of the community. Offenders convicted of sex assault, criminal harassment, kidnapping, abduction are indeed dangerous. Furthermore, Section 752 defines the above offenses as a serious personal injury offense, which the provincial appellate courts have consistently excluded from conditional sentence consideration. The number one priority for the federal government is to keep Canadians safe. The Liberal government has been derelict in their responsibility. This soft on crime, ideologically driven bill needs to be defeated. Thank you, Madam Speaker. <clears throat> The, the Honourable Member will have five minutes for questions and comments after the oral question period. Resuming debate, the Honourable Member for Brantford Brant has five minutes of questions and comments remaining. The Honourable Member for Winnipeg North is rising on a question for the Honourable Member for Brantford Brant. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And, and I guess my question is, recognizing the great divide where here in the, in the Liberal government, we understand that judges play a very important role in providing them that additional discretion to look at the circumstances around giving dispositions on sentencing. My question to my colleague across the way, why does a Conservative party not have faith in our judges in Canada. Exactly. <laughs> the Honourable Member for Brantford, Brant. That's if the Honourable Member actually listened to my speech, at no point in time did I indicate that we as a Conservative caucus absolutely have no faith in judi judicial discretion in levelling an appropriate sentence. As a Crown Attorney for the last 18 years, I was in front of judges every single day. My point was, Mr. Speaker, was that there already exists sufficient tools within the criminal code where judges can exercise that discretion. They certainly do not need any further assistance from this Liberal government. Order! Order! We're trying to have a debate. If you want to have a conversation, that's okay. But just maybe take it to the lobby or outside in the hallway. The Honourable Member for Okanagan, Similkami Nikolai, is rising Thank on you, a uh, question. Mr. Speaker, and I certainly listen intently to the member's speech. And given his experience as a Crown Prosecutor in, in Ontario, I think his experience lends itself to, to the debate uh, excellently. Here, here. I'd like to ask the member this. There is changes in the bill to conditional sentencing. Obviously, if any mother was to see that kidnapping could now be uh, a bit used, uh, they, that someone who's charged with kidnapping could be given conditional sentence, as in house arrest, Mr. Speaker, I think they'd find that egregious and wrong. Is, is there other offenses that he believes that should not be subject to conditional arrest? Honourable Member for Brantford, Brant. I thank my honourable colleague uh, for that very important question. Everything in this bill, Bill C-5, in terms of removing those offenses that are currently delineated under Section 742, which is the conditional sentence regime, in my respectful submission, Mr. Speaker, are all serious, violent offenses. To his point, kidnapping, sexual assault, criminal harassment, abduction, these are all serious personal injury offenses. What I was trying to indicate with the time that I had available in my 10 minutes is that there is absolutely zero reference to amending Section 742 to highlight whether or not those offenses that they're delineating can still be substantiated by way of a conditional sentence. A condition precedent to Section 742 is that justice must be satisfied that an offender serving that sentence in the community does not pose a risk. Those offenders convicted of a sexual assault, criminal harassment, kidnapping most definitely pose a community risk. But moreover, Section 752 of the Criminal Code talks about excluding any offenses where there is a serious personal injury offense. 
kidnapping certainly qualifies, as does sex assault, as does criminal harassment, as does abduction. Questions and comments? Questions and commentaires? The Honourable Member for Courtney Alberni has a question. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank my colleague for his speech. And, and Mr. Speaker, we've heard a lot of people talk today about what's missing in this bill and the shortfalls in this bill, especially when it comes to dealing with the health crisis, the, the overdose and opioid crisis. Uh, we've heard many people calling for decriminalization. You know, as, as a judge, uh, I, does he agree with the Police Chiefs Association, medical health officers, uh, social workers, science, and uh, uh, those that are leading experts when it comes to dealing with this overdose crisis, that we need to uh, decriminalize uh, for personal possession and to ensure that everybody has a safe supply. I'd love to hear his perspective as a former judge, given that this is becoming, you know, well-rounded support from right across the country, including uh, the request from Toronto, British Columbia, uh, and Vancouver in terms of an exemption currently under the Controlled Drugs and, uh, Act, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Brantford. Brad, in 40 seconds or less, please. I thank my, uh, my Honourable uh, colleague, and I want to thank him personally for the uh, elevation to my, my past career. I was not a judge of the Provincial Court or the Superior Court, but rather a Crown Attorney. But, but to address the important issue that he raises is there already exists, uh, Mr. Speaker, a regime in place that vests federal prosecutors, as it does with provincial prosecutors, to exercise their discretion appropriately to deal with those individuals struggling with substance abuse and to be very creative in terms of how they wish to prosecute, or moreover, what sort of representations they make to a justice to deal with the rehabilitation issue. Resuming debate.